preaching. I pray, Father, you'd, you'd uh, be with Brother Jeff as you bring the sermon tonight. I pray for those that are not here right now, Lord, that you bring them on and, and, and help them, Lord, uh, keep everybody safe, Father. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, brother. All right, let's turn over to uh, hymn number 125. Hymn number 125. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Amen. <clears throat> Hymn number 125 in the red. Still repeat. 
Let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. Now, uh, I preface chapter 8 uh, by saying that chapter uh, 8 and 9 are about giving. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 in chapter 9. And uh, this is one of the uses of Christian giving. Um, nowadays, uh, the church, and this is probably based on, uh, the old Southern Baptist way of doing things, um, years and years ago, uh, they, uh, they had, uh, uh, standard forms of, uh, services that they would, uh, promote in the denominational churches, and a part of that was taking of the offering, and, uh, you had different things that the offering did. You had you had the tithe that people brought. You had gifts, and then then they started the different missions outreaches in the denomination, and uh, they did all kinds of th uh, things with those. Uh, but one of the things that's uh, most biblical is helping out the saints. And uh, what had happened here, and it's, it's based on the Bible, what had happened uh, here is we know that the, the church started in Jerusalem. Uh, that's where Christ died on the cross, and he was rose uh, from the grave. And the disciples were there uh, when the church started in the beginning of the book of Acts. So everything kind of radiated out from Jerusalem to begin with. And... Uh, there was a lot of believers uh, in the fold in Jerusalem. Uh, they were also connected with the temple because uh, most of them were uh, uh, Jews that had gotten saved. Uh, but the Jews weren't independent. They were under the Roman Empire. And uh, the fortunes of some of the colonial cities uh, that the Roman Empire had kind of went up and down with the fortunes of the empire. So, uh, Jerusalem had reached a time when enough of the saints had gone out to preach in other parts where there wasn't as many of them. And uh, the Romans were kind of having a downturn, I guess. And so they kind of took Jerusalem with them. And the saints were having a really hard time. Just maintaining, uh, buying food to eat, clothes to wear, uh, keeping the ministries there going, uh, maybe paying their preachers. Uh, uh, we don't know all the details of it. But Paul uh, decided that it behooved the, the churches that had gotten the gospel from that central hub to pay back to the church whence they came. And so uh, he is collecting an offering here to send back to the, uh, the, the nation of Israel and the Christians that are in Jerusalem to help the saints. And so this is what this is about, is helping the saints. And every now and then, we need to help the saints. Uh, we do that uh, plenty of that here. Uh, when we uh, build these buildings overseas and uh, we help these uh, uh, preachers to... Uh, do whatever ministry they've come and presented to us, a lot of times it's at helping them so they can help other people. Uh, if the missionary is scrabbling every day to get food to put on the table, he's not going to have time to do God's work. God's work takes time. If you don't believe me, follow me around for about two weeks. Uh, I'll wear you out. I'll tell you, I will. Um, so let's read... Uh, Verses 1 through 5 in chapter 9 the second Corinthians. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know 
the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So Paul's saying, look, I've gone around and bragged on you that a year before he's writing this, this epistle, that they had been ready to send money then. But uh, Paul hadn't been ready to come by and get it yet. And uh, so he, he's saying, I, I ho hope you live up to me bragging about you. Uh, yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain, in this behalf that, uh, as I said, ye may be ready. So Paul is hedging his bets here. He's, he sent the brethren to make sure that everything is, uh, what they're boasting about is true. And make all this offering so when he comes to town and he gets it, he can just take it right on and, and won't have to uh, sit around and wait till they, to get it all together. Uh, at least happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Uh, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, and make up beforehand your bounty, uh, whereof ye had noticed before, uh, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, and not as a matter of covetousness. Help us, Lord, as we study your word. Uh, give us what you'd have us to have in this scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, I do want to establish the fact that the Corinthians were a giving church. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Paul said, Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on your behalf. So Paul uh, gives them a, a, like a little thank you there at the first chapter saying, Look, you, you helped me out when I needed help. And thank you for that. So they've been known in the past to be a very generous church. Uh, I don't mind being known as a generous church at all. Do you? Uh, in fact, that's a good thing to be known by. Uh, look, giving uh, is to God, no matter how we give. Whether we give to uh, the missionary on the field, or the home missionary, or the evangelist, or uh, to some ministry. Like, if we take on the Christian Law Association, that's not a mission per se, uh, in particular, but they are doing God's work to help out God's saints. So, in, in a way, they have a missionary bent to what they do. They're just not a foreign missions. Uh, but I would like to give to them. Uh, for years, we've given to the mission board uh, at uh, Words of Life, Med uh, not Word, Word for the World ministry. We did that for years. Um, we, we've given all kinds of uh, monies to all kinds of people, uh, both foreign and domestic, to uh, do God's work. And um, it's a good thing to help each other out. Uh, Isaiah 41, 6 says, They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said unto to his brother, Be of good courage. Uh, and that's an Old Testament verse. It shows us that uh, the commandment that says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, uh, we're filling part of that commandment by helping the brethren do God's work. Uh, and Paul, uh, they, he had talked to the Corinthians before about helping other people. Uh, we won't go to it, but if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 16-16, uh, uh, you would see a verse on that. I want to look at three things about helping the saints tonight. Um, first of all, uh, I, I want to talk about giving in your thinking. Giving in your thinking. Giving, or anything we do for God, uh, starts in one of two places. It starts here in the mind, or it starts here in the heart. Um, it doesn't matter to God where it starts. But a lot of times, God will put an idea into your head. And He won't let it go. Uh, and a lot of times that thing migrates from here down to here, and usually it's about that point we decide we're going to do something about it. But the Bible has a lot to say about thinking and, and, and uh, doing uh, something for other people. Um, uh, thinking uh, has, uh, uh, just thinking, has had a, uh, a definite uh, um, 
influence on the history of mankind. Uh, you look at Genesis 6. Uh, in Genesis 6, it talks about, when well, verse number 11, uh, the Bible says the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And if you read that whole chapter, you will find out that that had to do with men's thinking. What they were thinking turned into what they were doing. This is why when mass media came along in the form of newspapers, uh, people started uh, um, getting uh, ideas from other places. Um, I told you this morning I've been reading that book about Samuel Adams. And that was the case in the colonies. Uh, when the English came over here and uh, they planted the colonies, they planted uh, uh, Jamestown, and they planted Plymouth, and they planted uh, all these uh, little uh, colonies up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, they were kind of cut off from the home country. But pretty soon, uh, as the towns grew and more and more people were born and more and more people came over, somebody got the bright idea and said, well, we need some newspapers in this little town. And so they would order a printing press and the ship would bring it over and they'd set it up and, and maybe someone had been a printer back in jolly old England or, or something or maybe they got a book to learn how to do it and, and they would start publishing a, a newspaper. And well, uh, printed material was very precious back in those days. So you just didn't read the paper and throw it away like we do now. You would kind of keep it because it was kind of like a running history book uh, what was going on. And a lot of times you might have to ride down the colonies to another colony to uh, do some kind of business. Maybe you were in a trade or maybe you had something to sell or maybe you had something you needed to buy from the other colony so you could sell it in your colony. And so when you went down there, you probably had a, a, a bundle of old papers that you took to entertain yourself. And when you got there, uh, the people that you were dealing with probably saw them and said, well, let me read your papers. I'll give you some of mine to read. And so they trade them. And so they'd read each other. Well, pretty soon the papers are being mailed between the cities and people all along the colonies are reading each other's news and uh, they kind of formed a, a bond with one another. And, um, you know, they, they, they learned to think of themselves as one, one area instead of just all these little individual places. Um, and... and that's what thinking does for you. Thinking will kind of join you together. Uh, in Genesis 6, 5, um, I was trying to remember the verse that talked about the thinking. And I just, it just popped into my little brain. So let me read it to you before I forget it. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, there we go, uh, was only evil continually. So you see that the uh, thinking of mankind has has a, a, a definite bearing on what we do and uh, how we act and how we uh, treat other people. And God wants us to be givers in our heart. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people, they get stuff and they don't want to let it go. Um, I remember Brother Don. Anybody remember Brother Don? Don was a, a giving soul. Uh, there was a little article in uh, the paper uh, this week, and it was about this little man. Where was he from? Uh, I think he was from Ohio somewhere. And uh, he would go into the drugstore every week and, and get a load of medicine. He had a lot of medicine. I, I understand that. And uh, one day he came up to the phar pharmacist uh, and uh, about three or four years ago, and handed the pharmacist a $100 bill after he paid for his stuff and said, I want you to take this and, and, and apply it to someone's bill. Don't tell them where it came from, uh, but I'll let you decide who needs it the most. And so the pharmacist took it and thanked him and, and thought that was the end of it. Well, the very next month he came in, he had another $100 bill. And the next month came along and there was another one and another one and another one. And this, this had been going on since 2014. And this man died uh, at the end of last year. And so this man 
from 2014 to the end of his life in 2022, every month gave $100 to the pharmacy to help pay for other people's medicines. And come to find out about this guy, he was giving stuff all over the place. And I, when I read it, I, I, I just had to shed a tear because I missed Don so bad. I said, that's Don. I'll look for another Don. Because that's what Don would do. Um, he heard you needed something. Uh, all of a sudden, it, it would appear in your car seat. You knew where it came from. It came from Don. And uh, so our thinking very much has to do with the way we act and the way we think. And God is keeping track of those things. Isaiah 66, 18 says, For I know their work and their thoughts, and it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Talking about the nation of Israel when he finally restores the nation of Israel in the millennium. Uh, but the, what I want to lift up that, that, that verse is God is keeping track of what we're thinking. Uh, so don't think you can do something just for show. God is keeping track of your real motives um, and what you do. Um, and I want to say uh, we need to give God control of our giving. A lot of people don't want to do that because they're scared uh, they think, well, God will just have me give everything away. No, God will not have you give everything away. And if he does, he will make sure he replaces it. I guarantee you that. Because he loves his children. Proverbs 16, 3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. And the thing is, you have to give your mind and your heart to God. Especially if you want a giving heart. An evangelist held a service uh, one time, and at the close of which, uh, a little girl presented uh, a bouquet of flowers, the first of the springtime uh, that, that had been brought forth. And he asked, well, why do you give me these flowers? She said, because I love you. Uh, do you bring the Lord Jesus such gifts uh, of your love at times? He inquired. Oh, said the little girl, uh, I give myself to him. There you go. There you go. I bet that little girl was a giver. Amen. Uh, secondly, we need to prepare and plan for our giving. Um, now, notice Paul is very concerned that they have a plan and they stick to their plan. Um, not all... Giving is supposed to be off the cuff, spontaneous. I, I've been to these camp meetings, you know, where the, the moderator of the camp meeting, they make a big deal of, uh, of uh, you know, being very spontaneous in a lot of this stuff they do, especially taking offerings. Look, it's a lot better to get people prepared to give an offering. They'll give a lot more in the long run than if you hit them just on the spur of a moment. Look, if you, if you come to a camp meeting, you got three bucks in your pocket, it, and you feel like God tells you to give everything, you don't have three bucks. But if you had been prepared a little bit, you might have put 50 bucks in that pocket. See, I mean, you have to kind of prepare and plan to give. And there's nothing wrong with that. David was a very good example of that. We know in the Bible that David very badly wanted to build a temple for God. And God told him, no, you can't. I'm not going to let you. You've been a, uh, a warrior and you've shed a lot of blood and you've been kind of a, uh, a, a man that, uh, you know, is a, more of a fighter than a builder. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let your son build that temple. And so David said, okay, well, if I can't build it, at least I can help my son with the preparation for it. And so David started gathering stuff together. Uh, First Chronicles 22.5 says this, and, and David said, Solomon, my, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be build, builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnifical, I like that word, of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. This thing, lots of it was covered in gold. I wonder how much gold he had to have in the sock piles. So, so David just started laying stuff aside. 
he'd go out and conquer and take the enemy's gold and he'd put it aside. He'd go out and uh, get a bunch of their claws and, uh, you know, uh, rich clothing and he'd put that aside. Uh, he'd go out and get the, uh, you know, the oil and the whatever else, they, the bricks or whatever else they needed and he'd put it aside. And by the time he died, he had this whole pile of stuff so that Solomon was ready to do his job. And people came from all over to see that building. Because somebody prepared and planned to give. Uh, and look, planning is part of your Christian armor. Did you know that? A lot of people think, well, I don't need to plan as a Christian. I'll just, I'll just go out every day and kind of wing it. No, we're not supposed to wing it. We're supposed to have a very... Uh, uh, definite plan of how to attack our Christian life. Ephesians 6.15, part of the Christian armor is the, 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 the footwear of the armor. Uh, and it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Not only are we supposed to go out and preach the gospel, but we're supposed to have a plan to preach the gospel. If you go into my office, you'll see a little pile of stuff on my desk. You'll see a Gospel of John. You'll see a little flyer uh, talking about our YouTube channel. And you'll see a church track stuff in that little Gospel of John. And, and I got a little baggie in there that fits across my shoulder. And I got a plan. I've got streets marked off that I've already visited. Uh, when things clear up and I can get back on the, the street, I plan to, uh, I know exactly where I'm going to pick up and how far I'm going to try to get. And I, I've got a plan. You say, does the plan work? Well, I don't know. Sometimes it works the way you think it's going to work, and sometimes God honors your plan and blesses you anyway some other kind of way. Uh, it, 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 it's the truth. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. There's a lot of times me and Vic visited <clears throat> out from the other property. We spent 10 years of doing it. Brother Vic, how many people would you say came to church from our visits. One or two after 10 years of doing it. But how many people came that we didn't ever talk to? Bunches of them. Because God would draw them. He knew we were trying hard. And so he would draw them in. Uh, God blesses the planning uh, of, of, of the Christian armor. Uh, by the way, that footwear that the Romans used to uh, to wear it uh, it's called Caligae Caligae and it's a hobnailed heavy soled military sandal boot and there's pictures of it on the internet you can see it was worn as standard issue in the Roman legions for the foot soldiers and the auxiliary including the cavalry uh, they were heavy-duty, thick-sole, open-work uh, uh, boots with hobnail soles. They were worn by the lower ranks of the Roman uh, cavalrymen and the foot soldiers and possibly some of the centurions. Uh, it had a reputation for being very durable footwear. Um, it was so famous for being uh, durable and um, kind of... Uh, uh, something that you, that you wanted to have on your feet, that when uh, the three-year-old um, Gaius was born in the first century A.D., they named the little fella the Little Boot. And of course, you recognize his name is Caligula. Well, it didn't turn out so good, that guy. But his name was the Little Boot. He was named after the, the Roman footwear of the soldier. And look... You can have all the breastplates on you want and all the helmets on you want and all the things covering your middle section and your legs, but you've got to have something on your feet because if you don't, you won't make it very far. You really won't. I, I know there, uh, you go out to California and some places in Florida and people live on the beach and they like going around barefoot. Well, I, I guarantee you they don't go to Walmart barefoot. And they certainly don't eat in very many restaurants barefoot. Uh, you still see the signs, uh, no shoes, no sir, shirt, no service in a lot of places. Because people want you to wear shoes. 
God will help you get what you need to plan and, and, and to prepare to give to him. Psalm 10, verse 17, The Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. That will cause thy ear to hear. So not only does God help you, but once he helps you uh, uh, to pray and uh, to plan, he'll hear your request and he'll answer your prayer. That's pretty good. Uh, I mean, not only does God uh, 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 help us, but he'll prepare prayer us so he can, we can pray to him so that we can give something. And I've seen God do marvelous things. I really have. Um, I, I, I remember... Uh, brother John and uh, Brother um, Bill would go up to the missions conference up in Chattanooga. And we would send them with, at the time, it was a lot of money for us. It was like $500. And that they would, they would pray the whole time they were there who to give that money to. Because they wanted to be a blessing. And we got kind of a reputation of, uh, of being a given church. I said, well, how did we do that? God's always helped us along. And I, I, I think he will continue to help us because we got good hearts. We got good minds. Look, the last thing I want to say is motivation comes from the examples that we have for the saints and the exhortation of the preacher and the scriptures. Uh, Paul had to preach to folks a little bit to keep their enthusiasm up. Um, you know, communications were very slow back in Bible days. Uh, you would send a, a letter. Uh, usually you'd have someone take it for you. And they would have to uh, uh, get on their little donkey. And they would have to go to the nearest seaport. And then they would get on some ship. And uh, they might have to uh, change ships a couple times. And then they finally get to where the country where they was going. And they have to find another little donkey. And then have to get on that. And then they have to go uh, find the person. Go to the town where they live. And find the person that lived in the town. And finally after months and months and months and sometimes years here's the letter from uh, Paul and so he wanted to make sure that these people stayed enthusiastic about what they were uh, going to do he said it had been a year since he had heard from them and he wanted to make sure they were going to uh, still give uh, that uh, uh, amount they had talked about uh, look we have several good examples for us we have Jesus himself he was the highest example of giving you say, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 21, For even hereunto we, we, uh, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Now, that doesn't mean every Christian needs to go die on the cross. That's what he's not, not what he's talking about. He's talking about we ought to have a giving uh, heart and a giving mind, because Jesus, that's... He came so he could give himself. He, he didn't come to preach at people by and large. He didn't come to uh, uh, do a lot of things that he did. Heal people and perform miracles. All that was assigned to the Jews. He came to die on the cross and give himself a ransom for mankind. You say, well, uh, should we give ourselves a ransom for man? If it ever comes up, sure, do it. Americans never had to face this in our generation. Or the past, uh, my, my grandparents, I, I, and, and you think, wait, you know, you go back to the colonial uh, days, um, and, and you didn't have anything that even resembled this except going way back to the uh, days of Salem and the witch hunts and things. That's the only thing in this country you had like that. You had to go back into English history over in England to find in Europe to find anything where Christians would give up their life. An example, we've had it pretty good over here. But if it ever comes up, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The preacher is to be an example to you. And this is kind of hard because uh, I, I know a lot of preachers are like me. They don't advertise what they give. And I'm not going to advertise what I give. But I do give. Um, if you really wanted to know, I guess you could ask the counting committee. And they would tell you. It's an it's open book. So we don't keep anything secret. But... Uh, uh, I wouldn't give two cents for a preacher that didn't give to his own ministry. They're pretty lousy. Uh, Paul certainly did. Um, 
He told Timothy to make sure that he did. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, there you go, in spirit and faith and in purity. So all those things, he's supposed to be an example to the Christian. Look, when it comes to anything in the Christian life, you, you should be able to look at the preacher and say, okay, that doesn't mean the preacher's perfect. No, 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 no. No, I'm not perfect. Never have been perfect, never will be perfect. But I do try to be an example uh, that I can be to y'all. And... Uh, you know, even with those two examples, uh, Paul himself being an example and Jesus being an example, Paul thought they needed a little nudge. He thought they needed a little nudge. Verse number five says, I, I, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before uh, unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. So he says, Look, I'm going to give you a little nudge. I'm going to send the brethren over as the counting committee so that you can give it to them making track of it. Nothing wrong with that at all. Sometimes you have to give Christians a little nudge. Sometimes they get busy doing something else and uh, they, they forget about something else. Um, and, and I want to say this. Now, a lot of people would argue with this, but giving is connected with preaching. Did you know that? It is, it is not uh, unheard of that you pay the preacher and you make sure the church lights are on and you pay the bills and you give to the missionaries. All that we do around here is very biblical. Say, so prove it, okay? Romans 12, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honoring, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. And that was about two or three things in that passage had to do with giving. 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 Paul knew that there was a connection between the ministry and giving. I wouldn't give you uh, five cents for any preacher that didn't give his congregation a chance to give. Uh, I learned a lot from the old man of God that I came up with. And one of the things that they uh, impressed upon me and Brother Bill that we were under God to give the chance uh, to the people to give to his work. Now, in this church, we don't pass the plates. He said, what do you do? We've got a box. And that was started by the founder of the church. It's been continued on, and it'll, it'll continue on until I'm here. Um, but you have the chance to give to the Lord. And you're not giving it to me. Uh, I don't ever come and check how much is given every Sunday, do I, brother? You notice we don't put it on a board like some churches do. We leave that up to God and you. And you know what? I I've never been disappointed. I've never been disappointed. It's all how you train people, really. Teddy Roosevelt had four sons. The first son joined the military as did the second son and the third son. His last son finally came along, became that age, and announced that he would join the army. Teddy got incensed and swore that he did not want his four sons joining the army or any other military organization. He went around the house yelling, not all four, not all four. Well, finally his wife got him and took him into the other room and set him down huh. and said, Ted, look here. If you'd raised your sons as eagles, 
you can't expect them to fly like sparrows. Now think about that. Teddy Roosevelt was who he was. And he, rose his, he uh, raised his son up just, just like he was. And he was a brave man, liked to go fight in the military. Uh, he couldn't expect his boys to do anything else but be like eagles and fly. And I can't expect anything else from, uh, you've had good training. Uh, Brother Wheat was a very generous man. Brother Shiver was a very generous pastor. Um, uh, Brother Bill was a very generous pastor. And I, I love to give things away. In fact, I'm in a ministry that gives stuff away. Have been for a long time. Uh, but it all, all has to do with how we think and, and how we feel. And, and it, it, it never hurts to help people. Uh, God will give back to us so that we can keep giving back to him. It's kind of a circular thing. And you know who gets all the glory? Not us. God does. If it's done right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. When we fill the offering box up, or we have that great big thing that we send overseas to, to, to help the missionary feed people, or build a building, or uh, help with some uh, project that they've got, it's, it's not us that's doing it, it's God that's allowed us to do that, and we should give Him the glory, because it's His work, it's His gift, His money that we're giving, it's to Him. And we don't ever need to forget that. Ever, ever, ever. It's easy to apply these things in the family because you've got this small little group of people. But when you get many families together and uh, they form an organization, an organism, and then you have tendrils going out all around the world. We got people that we support all around the world. Um, sometimes it's easy to lose track of what's going on. Look, the same God that gave you your family is the same God that gave us our church and our uh, incomes and allowed us to come across these pro uh, projects. Um, pray for the men of the church, the trustees. Um, sometimes we don't know where to give the money and we have to pray. And we're in the process of doing that right now, aren't we, gentlemen? They're saying, okay, Lord, we've got a gift we want to give. Where do we give it? And, and I have no doubt God will show us what to do. So pray for us and we'll pray for you. And just remember, uh, we can only give because he gives to us. And we certainly don't deserve anything from God, but he loves us anyway. He loves us. And boy, that's a good thing to be loved by God. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you love us. And Lord, uh, love is giving. And you gave your son, and then the, God, you saved our soul, and and we, we we get down on our knees and we pray, and you give us things that we pray about, and uh, God, and help our families, and when tough times come, you help us. Thank you, Lord, for what you do. Uh, God, uh, help us, God, just to, uh, every day, wake up and, and look at the new day and say, thank you, Lord. And then at the end of the day, when the day's done, say, thank you, Lord. Because no matter what goes on, and you, you allow us to do the things that we do, it's because of you. And God, help us never to forget that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.